Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to continue talking about movements of the thoracic spine and how they affect movements of the ribs. And so we talked about flexion and extension in the previous video. Now we're going to do lateral flexion and rotation. So we're going to review a few things here before we get into the mechanics. Okay. Uh, first of all, remember that for the ribs, they attach to the thoracic spine um, really at two joints generally. There's the costovertebral joint and the costotransverse joint. The costotransverse joint not only is the articulation between the ribs tubercle and the transverse process of the vertebra, but this is where the movement actually occurs mostly. Okay, and so the upper costotransverse joints are for the upper ribs, the lower costotransverse joints are for the lower ribs, and furthermore, the upper costotransverse joints facilitate more rotational movements, whereas the lower costotransverse joints facilitate more gliding translation movements. Okay, uh, but the big thing really to understand are the directions of the movements. Are they superior or inferior or whatnot? Okay, now, uh, for lateral flexion, uh, lateral flexion exhibits what we call type 1 mechanics. Okay? Um, when we have lateral flexion and rotation in the spine, uh, we can't have one without the other. So if I laterally flex to one direction, I can't help a little bit of rotation. Likewise, if I rotate, I can't help a little bit of lateral flexion. So they occur with each other. Now, do they occur in the same direction or opposite directions? In type 1 mechanics, they occur in opposite directions. So when I have lateral flexion to the right or side bending to the right, I cannot help a little bit of left rotation. Okay, so they occur in opposite directions. We'll see in rotation in a few minutes that they follow type 2 mechanics where they occur in the same direction. So right rotation triggers right lateral flexion. Okay, the fact that these are opposites is going to do something a little bit weird, but we'll break it down um, one step at a time. So here we've got a posterior view of the spine. We've got right lateral flexion. And what I want you to keep in mind is that when we laterally flex to the right, there's going to be less space for the ribs on the right and more space for the ribs on the left. And so we're going to see these effects manifested as um, these movements down here. Okay, so we're doing right lateral flexion. What's going to happen here? Well, we're going to have a little bit of left rotation, and this is going to lead to a little bit of change in how downsloping and upsloping occurs. So when we laterally flex to the right, what is happening at the right facet joint? Okay. Well, it's downsloping. Okay. That would make sense, right? Because if we're laterally flexing to the right, we're compressing or close packing that right facet joint. But the downsloping is going to do something a little bit different than we're used to. Because generally, when we think of downsloping, it's inferior posterior glide of the superior vertebra relative to the vertebra below. Um, but here, it's going to be inferior and anterior movement relative to the vertebra below. Why is that? Look at this picture down here. This is also right lateral flexion, but it's just so much showing one intervertebral segment. When I laterally flex to the right, so the right side's gonna move down, the left side's gonna move up, right? But there's rotation to the left. That's gonna trigger actually um, a little bit of anterior glide of the right side relative to the vertebra below, okay? Because if I'm rotating this direction, that means this side on the right, there's going to be a little bit of anterior glide. There would actually be a little bit of posterior glide on the left side. Okay, So it's not the traditional downsloping. It is an inferior glide, but it's associated with a little bit of anterior movement because the rotation occurs in the opposite direction. Okay, So keep this anterior glide in, in, in perspective. What will that trigger at the upper costovertebral joints? It'll trigger anterior rotation. Remember from the flexion extension video that when I have um, anterior movement of the vertebra above relative to the vertebra below, that triggers anterior rotation of or at the costotransverse joint. And one thing you can do to visualize that is if you put a dot right on the top of the rib, um, if the rotation occurs at the costotransverse joint such that that dot moves anteriorly, it's anterior rotation. If the dot moves posteriorly, it's posterior rotation. That's what we saw in extension. But here, um, it's going to be anterior rotation at the upper costotransverse joint. And remember what happens in anterior rotation. Overall, the, the anterior parts of the ribs, where we can see them, 
and just overall the rib is going to rotate inferiorly. It's going to rotate downward. Okay, so upper costal transverse joints anterior rotation triggers the upper ribs to rotate down. Now for the lower ribs, the opposite is going to occur. Um, it's going to be gliding movement, but the lower costal transverse joints facilitate superior glide, and so the lower ribs are going to translate superiorly. What's going on here? Upper ribs rotating down, lower ribs translating up. So even put more simply, upper ribs move down, lower ribs move up. And so that allows them to approximate each other. Upper ribs move down, lower ribs move up. Why is that important on the right side during right lateral flexion? Because there's less space for the ribs on that side. So it would make sense that they approximate. And the best way to do that is for the upper ribs to inferiorly rotate and the lower ribs to superiorly translate. Okay. Now, the opposite's going to occur on the left side. Now, we're still talking about right lateral flexion. It's not left lateral flexion. It's just right lateral flexion, but we're looking at the left side, the left ribs. Everything's opposite. So that left facet joint is going to upslope. Why is it upsloping? It's upsloping really because um, it, you're gapping that facet joint because the upper rib's actually bending upward on the left side. But remember, you're going to have a little bit of posterior glide, so a non-traditional upslope. And that's because of that left rotation. So we're rotating left. This um, transverse process is going to move a little bit posteriorly. And so that's going to have posterior glide and trigger a little bit of posterior rotation at the upper costo transverse joint. Okay, so posterior rotation. What happens during posterior rotation? Well, the ribs as a whole are going to rotate upwards, at least the upper ribs. So when the upper costal transverse joint has posterior rotation, the upper ribs superiorly rotate. And then the opposite is going to take place at the lower costal transverse joint. They're going to facilitate inferior glide, and so the lower ribs as a whole are going to translate inferiorly. So what does this mean? The upper ribs uh, rotate superiorly the lower ribs inferiorly translate. Or to put even more simply, upper ribs move up, lower ribs move down. You can see that over here on the left side, upper ribs move up, lower ribs move down. Why does that make sense? Because when we laterally flex to the right, there's more space for the ribs on the left, so they can expand apart or they can separate. And the best way to do that is move the upper ribs up, move the lower ribs down. Now, if we did left lateral flexion, there would be a little bit of right rotation, and these would be flipped, okay? Uh, because if we laterally flex to the left, then there would be less space on the left, more space on the right, okay? So just make it make sense. Think about what would have to happen to gap the ribs or approximate them. Now, if we can also say the range of motion for lateral flexion in the thoracic spine is typically for passive about 25 to 30 degrees, okay? And it follows this type 1 mechanics, where lateral flexion and rotation occur in the opposite directions. In rotation, they occur in the same direction. So rotation follows type 2 mechanics. So this is back to what we're used to thinking about. So if I rotate my spine to the right, I'm going to have a little bit of right lateral flexion. Okay. So likewise, we can talk about what happens on the right side, on the right facet joints and the right ribs, and also the left facet joint and the left ribs. Let's do the right side first. So if I am rotating to the right, then on the right side, at those right facet joints, I'm downsloping. This is back to the traditional downsloping we're used to thinking about inferior and posterior glide of the superior vertebra relative to the inferior vertebra. And so if I've got um, really um, sort of posterior glide at the right side, that's going to trigger posterior rotation at that costo transverse joint. And remember what happens for posterior rotation that's going to result in a net rotation of the ribs up. So I'm going to actually have superior rotation of the upper ribs. But for the lower costal transverse joints, they allow gliding, but in the opposite direction. So on the right side, I'm going to have the lower costal transverse joints facilitating inferior glide and therefore inferior translation of those lower ribs. So let's think about this. The upper ribs move up, the lower ribs move down. What does that do to the space between the ribs? It actually separates the ribs. So actually when you, when you rotate to the right, the right side actually has more space. And so if there's more space, those ribs are going to be able to separate. And the best way to do that is for the upper ribs to rotate up and the lower ribs to translate down. 
Now the opposite occurs on the left side over here. So here, because we're rotating to the right, uh, there's going to be um, a superior anterior glide at the left facet joints. Okay, um, the superior part of the glide is really more due to the right lateral flexion, um, but the anterior glide is more due to the rotation. But anyway, with that anterior glide in the upslope, the upper costotransverse joints are going to undergo anterior rotation. And remember, for anterior rotation, the net effect is those ribs rotate downwards. And so for upper costotransverse joints, anterior rotation facilitates inferior rotation of the upper ribs. Again, those lower costotransverse joints, they do the opposite, always the opposite. You're starting to see a pattern there. The lower costotransverse joints facilitate superior glide, and then the lower ribs translate superiorly. And what does that do? Well, if you think about it, the upper ribs are rotating down, the lower ribs are translating up. So the ribs are coming closer together, right? If we think about it like this, I know this is a different movement, but uh, the upper ribs are rotating down, the lower ribs are, are, are translating up, There's up there approximating. And so that means when you rotate to the right, the left side of the rib cage is actually less space for the ribs. And so to accommodate that, that decrease in space, they're going to um, approximate. They're going to come closer together. And the best way to do that is for the upper ribs to rotate inferiorly and the lower ribs to translate superiorly. And with thoracic rotation, um, the typical passive range of motion is about 30 to 35 degrees. Okay, So when you're looking at these movements, whether it's flexion extension, lateral flexion, or rotation, the big thing to think about is, to help you make sense of it, is there less space for the ribs or is there more space for the ribs? If there's more space, they're going to separate. And so the upper ribs move up, the lower ribs move down. If there's less space for the ribs, they're going to approximate. So the upper ribs move down and the lower ribs move up. Okay. But in any case, hopefully this video cleared up lateral flexion and rotation for you. Um, in the next video after that, we'll talk more about how rib movements are influenced by breathing mechanics. So join us then. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.